On today's show, we're back with part two of two of myself and Glenn Willis talking all things Clint Capella when it comes to his game, how it affects the Hawks, what's next for the Hawks, and much more. And all of that is coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1731 of the Lawton Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Rowland, coming to you on a Tuesday here in early June. And this is part two of two with my friend Glenn Willis joining me to talk about Clint Capella in player capsule fashion. So if you missed anything from part one or just didn't know it was, that was certainly existing at this point in time, that is the place to begin this conversation. It should be available in your same podcast feed right now. Part one should be there. It should be about a half hour or so of Clint Capella talk, and this is part two, picking up where we left off with myself and Glenn. Again, as we always do with these player capsules, trying to paint the entire picture with regard to Clint Capella. On this episode, we had Sadiq Bay in the past, Mo Gay in the past, all the young guys, etc. We are still rolling through all of these, so stay tuned for more of it in the future. But without any more delay, here we go with part two with myself and Glenn talking about Clint Capella. Let's go to the offense, Glenn. We have to talk about the offense. So, uh... Okay, dealer's choice. Do you want to start with the stuff that Clint still does pretty well or the stuff where he doesn't do very well? Your choice. <laughs> he does stuff well still? Uh, no, I mean, uh, he, we'll he does. Positives, one, thing, but... one, thing, one thing in particular, uh, he does really well still. Yes. Yeah, well, we, I mean, people are tired of hearing me talk about like how Vance is on the screener. Um, you know, his rescreening is so good. And, and, and I know that's such a little kind of nuanced area of the game. But like when Trey loses his angle because he has a great defender on him, Clint's ability to flip the screen and give him the angle again. Clint's ability to kind of—I mean, there are times Trey is like stuck with the ball with no angle, and Clint's like just toss me the ball and I'll pitch it back to you and, and reset the, the angle of the screen. So his pitch back stuff is—I mean, it's just—I mean, it's so good, you know. All that stuff is so good, um, and that—and that's where he is, right? His—he was like pretty rough in DHO, like the first half of the season, like where Quinn has his centers kind of, I mean, Quinn uses it different than when under Nate, Quinn uses it, Quinn uses his centers to move the ball from one side of the floor to the other, right? They'll come to the nail or they'll come to the three point break or a little bit to center of that towards the top of the key. Quinn doesn't really want his guards and wings moving the ball from below one three-point break all the way down. he uses his center for that a lot and clint struggled the first i don't know 30 games of the year or whatever it was yep. like, those angles and that timing that footwork was pretty bad he got to like i don't know maybe a c plus level the second half of the season he was doing that stuff better but still not really what you want in a quinn offense but you know but so for me they're asking to do things that don't fit into his you know strengths at all but clint being a good teammate Tried, did his best, did what he could, made progress. Was it, you know, was it enough? You know, I, I don't know. But I mean, I, I, I think if you had like had a, a secret, you know, voting system across the league for guards that have played with Clint, like, you know, who's the best center to kind of help a guard and has all the little tricks. And that, we've talked about before. I think, I think one of the major reasons. The Hawks made that trade was Clint had all those thousands and thousands of reps with Harden doing all this stuff, right? So he came to the Hawks with uh, that full bag, right? You you and said so, that at the time to, 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 yeah. to credit to credit you. You said that at the time, <laughs> and you were one thousand percent right about that. And you know the Hawks were never as as plain and saying that publicly because you, you know it is teams always want to tell you what they what they're trying to do. But I and look for. Just to say this, I know a lot of people are done with Clint and the experience, and I, I get it. I'm, I'm not blind to why that is. He is frustrating sometimes yep. to watch. But Very. Yep. the and, – and Trey has – by the way, Trey, there's a reason – Trey is really high on Clint and always has been because Clint made Trey's life unfathomably easier than it would have been. It still does. It still does. And it still does now. You're right. But even, but especially younger – you know, young. I mean younger Trey – in particular, yeah. having who was, who was still great, figuring it out, right? Yeah, right. And that's why, and then that's a huge, that's not the whole reason why, but that's a huge part of why they brought him in. It's a great point you made then, you're making now, and you're 100% right. Um, and the screen stuff is, you know, people don't like talking about screens, and it is what it is, but it's very, it's very important. And I'm glad you pointed that out. And also, um, the progression point, he did have a five year high and assist rate this year, he never turns the ball over. Uh, like his, 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 his quote unquote turnovers are, are the missed layups, and I get that. But actual turnovers, he's a really low turnover player, and he, and he passed the ball better than he ever has this year. 
look, is, is he ever going to blow your blow your mind on a short roll? No, he's not. But uh, he he did get better over the course of the season, and um, you know, and Quinn, I think multiple times, and I, I tried to share some of this audio with people. Quinn openly acknowledged what they were asking Clint to do was kind of out, outside of Clint's uh, comfort zone offensively. Which look, these guys are NBA players. It's going to happen. I, I'm not saying that's a free pass, but I think everyone kind of knew the deal around the Hawks. Like, hey, Quinn, let's put the stuff in for the team's sake while acknowledging this is not the best for Clint. And that's, he's not the only one that was like that. Other guys, it's always that way with certain players, but um, that's part of the calculus. And just to say it out loud, I know I teased this second, he's still arguably the best offensive rebounder in the world. He certainly is the top three or four offensive rebounder in the league. And insert joke here about him, about him getting more because he misses his own shot. I totally understand that. And look, a few, <laughs> and, and look, <laughs> and look, a few, a few of those are true. A few of those are true. And like, there's some Moses yeah. Maloney going on with Clint sometimes. He's not doing it on purpose, yeah. but he does have some of his possessions where he has three or four shots in a row with his own misses and that boosts your numbers. But even if he were to strip those out, he'd still be a top five off the rebound. He, he was number one in the league this year by a pretty comfortable margin in rebound rate on offense. So like, you can you can laugh, you can quibble. He still he still creates possessions for the team that were not there before because of his office rebounding, and that that is a real thing that happens. Now, do I wish that he would throw the ball out sometimes? Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> Watching him, it's like, hey, Clint, why don't you just grab it and then turn and pass it to somebody else? And I get it. Just to say it out loud, I, I get that. But removing the noise, he still brings a ton of value there. That you know. Other guys can't match, and like it does, he, he does kind of need it because we'll talk about in a second with, with the finishing that you kind of alluded to earlier. But that shouldn't just be glossed over. I understand that it's that it comes with some other stuff, but he that's a huge value add that he brings still. Yeah, yeah, he, he does give you an, like as many extra possessions as almost any center in the league. But there is to you, you to, I mean, just kind of reiterating what you just said. But you wish that they often turned into more productive second possessions. Yes. Than they did because you know he turns and attacks the front of the rim, doesn't quite make the shot, um, just doesn't read the floor, doesn't see a, a defender kind of hanging out free, and when he does kick it out, he's kind of throwing it kind of behind himself and not really seeing where he's passing. You know, we we, yeah. you know, we, we could put a whole kind of you know shack it's you know, it's tunnel it's it's tunnel vision is what I would it's it, it's a tunnel vision thing and like and look I'll be the first to admit that it, it drives me crazy so I can't imagine like. People that are already yeah. fed up with Clint, how they feel when that happens, yeah. and I'm sure the yeah. coaches would say the same thing. There's just to say, there's no way that the coaches don't say that to him. Like, hey, Clint, why don't you just be a little bit more under control? And it's just a maybe it's a mindset thing or whatever. But um, that all comes into play. I do want to just as a transition point. You mentioned it earlier, but it's worth kind of focusing on for a second. He had his worst efficiency season as a, as a shooter slash finisher. Since he was a rookie, basically, or second year player in Houston, like when he was still a, a bit player. Um, the miss the misses around the rim are well documented. He shot uh 61% on shots within four feet per clean in the glass. That's not a good number for a center. Um, he actually shot the best of his career outside of four feet this year, which most of those shots are like four and a half feet per clean. He doesn't really take 10 footers very often. But um, look, I I'm not blind to the even as the resident Capella guy. I'm not blind to the fact that the, the the finishing definitely regressed, and the way you put it earlier was perfect. In that two years ago, so the 22-23 season, there were already rumblings from fans about his finishing problems, and that that was just not true. Like he shot 65 percent from the field two years ago. Like he was objectively still a good finisher. This is the first time in his Hawks tenure where he's actually been a pretty bad finisher for a full season. Like it, he was he was yeah. pretty it was pretty bad, and. You know, do I think that it gets overblown sometimes because of the way it looks? Yes, but I will be the first to, as I'm, I'm acknowledging now, it was a problem this year. Like, you need your center to be a better finisher than Clint was this season, especially when he doesn't really do much else on offense as far as a score. Obviously, we talked about the peripheral stuff, but as a score, that's basically what his what what he can do is finish around the rim. And when he stops doing that at a even an average level, that becomes obviously a pretty big problem. Today's show is brought to you by BetterHelp. We all carry things around that create stress, whether it's big or small. Whether it keeps things bundled up, it starts to actually get to 
affect us in a negative way. Therapy is a safe space, though, to get things off your chest. Also figure out just how to work through what happens to be weighing you down in your life. Therapy is helpful for everybody. You can learn positive coping skills and how to set better boundaries with therapy and also empowers you to be the best version of yourself. It's not just people who have major trauma in their lives as well. I know I have my own stresses when it comes to work in the future, et cetera, and we can also benefit from getting things off our chest. I know I can I can as well. If you're thinking about starting, th starting therapy, Give BetterHelp a try right now. It's entirely online. It's designed to be flexible and convenient to your schedule with BetterHelp. It's even suited to your schedule, which is huge if you're not getting a, not getting a time crunch like I often am in my busy, busy daily life. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Get it off your chest right now with the folks at BetterHelp. And the place to go is betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. And 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. One more time, the website to visit is BetterHelp. That's better H E L P. Betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. Yeah, and what takes it even to another level of being problematic is that if you're going to play, I don't know, whatever, 15 minutes a game with Trey, you, you've got to finish. I mean, you've got to be able to finish shots because yep. you are punting too much of Trey's value if you're not able to do that. And that's where I think Hawks fans, I, I think it was overblown sometimes. I do think, like, the, you know, like I said, I think the timing of some of the like worst misses, like uh, two and a half minutes left, <laughs> you're down six. You gotta yeah. have that right, and he just he just whiffs right. That's the stuff I understand. Like somebody wanted to literally like, throw something at the TV, <laughs> you know, because it's like they had to have that bucket to for, to win, right? But for me, like when you're if, if we're being super honest, I mean, I haven't. I mean, I keep my analysis away from my fandom, but I was. I mean, I think. I have to be transparent and say, I love a guy like Clint. It's not just Clint works hard, plays defense, all that sort of stuff. But if we're being really fair, if Clint is going to come back and be this, the same level of finish he was last year, pairing him with Trey for all those minutes, you're just punting a lot of Trey's value. Right. And that's yep. not the, an offensive formula. That's good enough. And are there some things they can do to kind of correct some of that? Maybe was it did the defensive workload as they were, he was working a lot harder, covering a lot more space in defense. It doesn't matter. Like, you know, if, if you come back with the same defensive plan, you're having your big at the level of the screen and you say to yourself, that's going to be a part of why he doesn't have the same energy at the rim on offense. It's, it's, just, I mean, for Hawks fans, I want to hear it. It wasn't good enough. It just wasn't yeah. good enough. Can he get it back? Can he get it back on track next year? I don't know. You know, that's something that we'll have to kind of wait and see. But when you're building around Trey, it's, it's not like the Hawks had the ability to always put the most three-point shooting in the floor last year. And that's one way. Clint probably finishes better if they had more shooting in the floor more consistently. right? He has less traffic, building the second defender less often. Do I think he would have like automatically been a 65% finisher again? Probably not that, but he probably would have been better. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, like when I'm when I'm playing, like what jumps out at you, even though Agneka is not the defender Clint is, Agneka's touch. And yet his self-creation in the paint. And even yep. Bruno progressed a lot, kind of creating like right in front of the rim this year, too. And so offensively, you've got I think you really do have to kind of think about is running it back with Clint really what we want to do on offense. Now, now if you choose to move on from him, which I know we're gonna talk about in a minute, like how in the world do you stabilize the defense? <laughs> the defense well, and that, that's the that's you got a lot no, of work to do to stabilize the defense if that's what you do. That's the ultimate question. So you know, you and I are not just pumping up Clint to pump up Clint. I know, I know that there's a thought out there that that's what we do. And it's that's not about that. It's just that I think what it comes down to in the end for you and me, and I don't want to speak for you, but is what you just said. It's like, okay, I'm not averse to moving on from Clint. I said last summer, I said, even as the Capella guy last summer, that they should have moved on from Clint. Like, yeah. I think that, that they, need, they needed to pull the ripcord at some point in time. And there is something to be said for Clint kind of being a safety blanket that for coaches and teams and like, I get it. Like sometimes you got to just take it away and figure it out. But I also say if they took Clint off the team defensively last year, they were already bad and they would, they, they would have been worse. Like that, that's going to make them worse if they take Clint away. And yeah, may, look, if they draft Donovan Klingon, I don't think rookie Klingon is going to be as good as Clint is right now defensively, but he will be probably by year two. Like Klingon's going to be really good anyway. So I'm not saying that Clint's yeah. irreplaceable. I'm not saying that. But in the short term, and this is a team that's trying to win right now, for better or worse, that would have made them worse. Now, would they be better on offense? Maybe, probably. I mean, it depends on who you're, who's playing those minutes. 
Um, but yeah, of course, Onyeka is a much more skilled finisher, much more skilled player offensively in general. But he doesn't do the same things Clint does on defense. It's not, and by the way, it's not always about Clint versus Onyeka. It's just it's just not. They're they're complementary players in some respects. But as far as team building is concerned, Capella is going to be expiring, right? Well, he is expiring as of now. Like this is last year's contract. Um, that could sometimes be a urgency point or a pivot point to say, all right, we kicked the can down the road a couple couple years in a row. Do we do something now? Um, and look, he's not the kind of guy that if he expires on your roster, um, that you're going to be furious that you that you let him expire. Like, you know, some of these top and, and players, like you can't let this guy expire. You, you got to trade him if they're going to leave. Clint's not that kind of player. Like, it's fine if he expires. But as far as team building is concerned, you know, this is uh, all of this stuff is linked with the draft, which we don't have to talk about a lot right now, but it's part of the deal here. Like, okay, let's say, for example, the Hawks decide to draft Alex Saar or Donovan Clean. How does that impact the center room in general? Klingon's obviously a pure center. Sar is maybe a center, maybe a four. We'll we'll see. But uh, are they really going to go into next season with Clint Onyeka and one of those two guys on the team making a lot of money for a number one overall pick? I kind of don't think so. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible, but probably not. Um, look, and this has been kind of rumbled out there, and it's not the not the Akongu podcast, but this is not the regime that drafted Onyeka. They are not married to Onyeka in the same way that people might think that they are. I'm not saying they're going to trade him or anything, but nobody nobody that was here when they drafted Onyeka is still here other than Tony. That's the only guy. Uh, so we'll see. So I'm not even sure what the question is, but I do think that they got to make some decisions open down the roster. That's not, that's not a big secret. And I've said this for two years, but man, some clarity of what of, of what they want at the five and contractually, team building wise, what they're planning to have at the five moving forward. Um, it's secondary to the guard decision that they have to make, I think, but it's not far behind. They, they got to figure out what they're going to do there because in the end, it's really, really, really hard to build a coherent defense if you don't know what you're going to do at the five and you don't have a real defender at the five. It's especially with a team that has Trey and right now DeJounte, all those guys like defensively you want to improve your defense it's hard to improve your defense and get worse defensively at the five at the same time <laughs> that's, all, that's all i'll say about that yeah and the center room it is interesting because if they do draft clean and i not, my personal view is i don't think they should I, you know i i mean i don't think it's terrible if they do but and they probably me, just, and they probably look it's june 2nd record they probably won't probably right. i'm not saying definitely but, but, but if, let's, let's say they do if they draft yeah. Klingon, I want Clint on the roster with Klingon. I, I kind of Clint is going to help Klingon <laughs> way more, right? In terms of the mentorship and all that sort of stuff that comes along, because you basically want Klingon kind of doing the stuff that Clint has mastered in a defensive way, well, even if he's not physically the same at executing like he was two years ago or what have you. Like, if that's the direct you go, and I, if, if they end up with Klingon, I'm hoping they tr- trade back three or four spots or something and get some some value there because I don't think they, they, they need to kind of use their one pick there. But if they draft Sar, I mean, Clint can certainly help Sar too, but it's more of a kind of the direct kind of, uh, you know, translation kind of plug into kind of the, the Clint circuitry for Klingon in a way that's not there for Sar. Uh, yeah. And so that's, and that's an important factor for me as well. Um, the key, I mean, if you go read all the reporting, reporting will say that people view Clint's. Now, this was before we got to the basically the postseason um, and uh, nearly the off season. That was more like last year when there was one plus, you know, on his contract still left. Two years left, yeah. It's easier to move him. Yeah, uh, and and the bottom line is is we saw teams that made it to the second rounds of the playoffs this year that could have used Clint. That you know. I, the Lakers could use Clint. You know, there, there are teams that need just you know, eighteen more minutes of like really professional play at center or whatever. And Clint's yep. salaries, you know, not what you, you know, perfectly have in mind for that. But they, it's, I think there there are places where Clint can really help a team, and it's a lower risk proposition for a team acquiring him. But I, like I said, if they if they if they end up with Clint at center, I want Clint on this roster next year doing the mentorship and all that sort. What does that mean for Nyeka? Hopefully it means that you can kind of move him for a really, really good wing or, you know, or something like that, as much as I love yeah. Inyeka, right? But, but I mean, that's where, in my mind, something I, have, I think we haven't started talking about is 
they kind of need to figure out what their draft strategy is and have a work back plan towards what do we actually want our center room to look like next year? Because for me, who they draft really steers you in one direction or another in terms of what player you prioritize bringing back next year at the position. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's where to take all time right now in the NBA and the NHL. If that was giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own, FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. And right now, if you're a new customer, get 150. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed. That's 150 in terms of bets that you can use on hoops and baseball, hockey, and so much more. But on all of your favorite baseball and basketball players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and much more. The app of FanDuel Sportsbook is really easy to use. And everything that you're looking for in sports betting space from over-unders to player props, Money lines, future bets, game props, and so much more. The FanDuel app is safe. It's secure. They cover the entire range of sports as well. That includes the NBA, the WNBA, NFL, college football, MLB, college baseball in the World Series going on right now, golf, tennis, soccer, auto racing, boxing, MMA, and so much more. And now is an awesome time. Sign up with the folks at FanDuel Sportsbook. And the place to go is FanDuel.com slash locked on. One more time, just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. It definitely does. And I think that, look, all these decisions are intertwined. And that's that's the thing about this, number, having number one pick. It's obviously a great thing to them that they got lucky and to get this pick. But it just even more shines a light on these overall decisions they have to make. And because you're not just drafting a player number one in a vacuum. You're drafting a player number one in concert with whatever else you're going to do. And it doesn't mean you draft for need. There's this whole discussion right now about need versus fit. I'm not saying that. But like for Kling is a great example. If you're going to draft on a Kling, that's a pretty that's a pretty clear like organizational decision about like how you're going to play because that that's a true seven foot two center. Like you are playing a certain way. I'm not saying he's super limited. Like he's a really talented player. But if let's just say you were to do that, that's an organizational announcement of how you're going to play in some ways. You know what I mean? Yep. Using that guy to totally. versus like. You know, if you take Risa Shea, let's just say, like that's a – all your doors are still open there. He's, he's a versatile wing player. I'm not arguing on be, on his behalf, but that's not like the, a, a uh, roster-building commitment. That's like, a, that's like a, hey, this forward can fit anywhere, which there's a lot of value in that, but we would learn less, you know what I mean, <laughs> about like the team's direction. SAR is interesting too, and then SAR is this like middle ground where it's, okay, is he a center, is he not? And, man, I can promise you this, Glenn. If they draft Alex R, the first question, I will have my hand raised the minute Landry walks in the room at the draft party, and I will say, hey, Landry, is Alex R center? And Landry will give me a non-answer. I promise you that. But I will ask the question first. Um, anyway, so, but you're right. It, it's all intertwined. Like, I'd love to know who they're going to pick right now. Honestly, they don't know. I don't think who they're going to pick right now. If I had to guess, they might have. Well, a I mean, the, like the, the 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 basically the European version of the combine is happening in the next few days or happening you know, right now, right. or you know. So there, there's wait. a lot of intel they're going to get on. Re- I mean, I know a lot of. I mean, I know a lot of Hawks fans. I I said this on Twitter a couple of days ago. If you think there's one obvious choice at number one, then I just disagree with you. Right. I I, it, I'm yeah, I, I I've also said like if it were me right now. I would go with Sar because I just think he's that unique of a kind of a, you know, what is the athleticism and size? It's just hard to find that athleticism and size template ever, right? Yeah. But uh, you know, I, I as I as I mentioned before we start recording, I have different outlets coming to me to ask me to pick for the Hawks in their mock draft, <laughs> and I fun. have decided so far I'm going to go like half the time with Sar and half the time with Risha Shea because I think you've got to put th- thought exercise out there. You know, and kind of put that into it. And one of the, the first one I wrote up, which uh, will be coming out on I think on on Monday of this week, was Risa Because if you look at the the Hawks' number one problem with their roster this past season was not trading Dejounte. Right, we've talked about like that pairing being maybe having a lower ceiling than what you'd want. But playing Garrison Matthews at the three and Wes Matthews at the four, and when one power forward goes down, you're playing six three, six four, six five guys at power forward. And Risha Shea is six ten, right? I mean, I guess we'll find out if he's really six ten here in the next couple of days, right? With the yeah, when the stuff comes out. But I mean, I so when I'm when I'm taking Risha Shea, I'm talking about they need size at that position. Now, part of that is what do you think of Mo Gay? What do you think of you know other guys? Is Risha Shea a four? You know. 
or whatever that is. But when I'm doing these mocks that I've been asked to kind of pick for the Hawks, I'm going 50-50, sorry, we should say so far, just to put thought exercise out there. But it's I mean, that, this is stuff they have to figure out before they make that pick. They have to figure this stuff out. Right. Before they make no, that. it's, and it's not, uh, not to do the whole draft thing here. We, we'll put it back to Clint before we get out of here, but it is not a vacuum. If there's ever a spot where one, one you know, a, in, in a draft where it's more of a vacuum, you could argue that number one pick is like you take the best guy. And I, I don't, I'm not arguing with that. But in this class, where there isn't a number one consensus, and on a team where you are not a blank slate, this is not Washington, where if Washington won the lottery, you take whoever the heck you think is the best player. You are a blank slate if you're the Wizards. Yep. The Hawks are not a blank slate. No matter what you think about the Hawks roster right now, they love Jalen. They're married to Jalen. And then I still, if it's me, I'd be thinking about what's best for Trey and all that stuff. But regardless, you have two, you have, you have for me, a, a legit superstar guard and then a substar guard in DeJounte. And you have Jalen. You're not a blank slate, so you have to think about the way you're building your roster, and that adds some intrigue. It's like a very interesting month and a half between the lottery and the draft for that reason. I mean, it's already interesting anyway they won the lottery, but um, I'd love to know just for this conversation. I mean, bringing it back to Clint before we get out of here. Um, look, for all of the reaction, we're probably still coming from this podcast. I'm not, I'm not uh, immune to that. I think we painted a pretty clear picture of what Clint is and what Clint isn't. But yeah. I, I still think that Clint is a starting caliber center on June 2nd, yeah. as we're recording this podcast, 2024. Does that mean he's a top 10 center anymore? No, he's, he's not. He, he was three years ago. He was four years ago. Yep. Um, but you're not like drawing dead if Clint's your starting center. But you need to know what he can and can't do. You need to understand what the rest of your roster is going to be. Um, there are limitations to him, which we've talked about almost on the floor offensively. We all know the limitations, and even defensively, where he's still better, you you laid it out like he's not perfect. So we endeavored to kind of paint the picture of all these players, and they're all they're all intertwined. But that's what I wanted to do on this podcast was be like, hey, basically, in short, Clint's still a valuable player. The notion that he's like some guy that you just fire into the sun is very silly. But he might get he might get traded, and that'd be very reasonable. I don't, I'm not going to say that any trade with Capella is a reasonable deal, but in a vacuum, him being traded is a very reasonable choice if you're the Hawks. Expiring contract, 30-year-old, Kongwu, et cetera. And, I, and obviously, he is available, as I, I reported. So is Mark Stein. Like he's, he's available to be traded. But you don't just fire him to fire him away. It, it's, it's a very interesting decision because of the give and take. That's a long way to put that. But, I mean, anything that you want to add on the, on, on the Capella experience in 2024 and 25? Because – uh, a big summer for him in general, too. I mean, he's expiring contract, and it's uh, interesting to see what happens next. I mean, the, the last big picture thought is just kind of the offensive lineup construction because you know, we talked about, you know, we'll talk about Hunter at some point, but Hunter made some progress this year doing the things Quinn wants, but he's still limited. He still has some of those same limitations. Yep. And even though Hunter and Capella work very well, well, well on defense, for what Quinn wants to do on offense, those two really don't work on the floor together very well where they are right no. now. Right? Not on offense, no. Right. And yeah, and that and then you mix DeJounte into that too, potentially. And DeJounte leaned into stuff Quinn was asking to do too, but still not really quite what you want. The ball, just not not enough passing, not enough kind of you know, quick decision making and all that sort of stuff. And so for me, I I think the Hawks have to really understand what their defensive template's going to be. They have to really, really understand that because they cannot recreate the same issues on offense last year. Um, and and especially if they don't really, really move the needle on defense. We, we saw what Quinn wants. Like, if you want to go watch one game, it's that Chicago game where they were breaking the paint every possession, driving and kicking and driving and kicking. I know V played that game. I think Hunter didn't play that game. And – um, you know, DeJounte, you know, no trade in that game and people want to make a big deal out of that or whatever, you know, but that is the, that game is the microcosm of what Quinn wants to see in offense. And it's hard to do all that stuff. If you have Clint and DeAndre on together, a little different if it's, you know, um, DeJounte kind of in the mix with those, you know, and so, the, the, so you know, they really have to kind of figure out what they're trying to tackle and, and kind of create on both ends of the court. And for where they are right now, it's not it's not easy. It's not easy at all because they are so fragile on defense that if they start undoing their defense to kind of get the offense where they want it to be, they've got to really have a plan for how they're going to stabilize that. And that's that's a very, very hard task ahead of them. 
I guess mm-hmm. we'll say that's why they get the big bucks. You know, but we'll see no, what they can do. But I mean, but but their, their offense, they when they lost games, close games. It was their offense at the end of the game that often lost in that close game when it wasn't Dejounte making one of his you know four game winners where it was this year. You know, but, but that's you know Quinn would put his best defensive lineup on the court to close games oftentimes, and they could not generate points in the last three four minutes of games. They cannot re- recreate that issue again next year. They can't not with not with Trey and your team. That can't be where you fell at the end of the game, and so that has that. Clint is a big, big part of understanding what he gives you, doesn't give you on defense. What he gives you, doesn't give you on offense, is a massive part of them kind of crack, you know, cracking that problem. And there's a lot to work through there. Uh, now, again, yeah. I love the kind of player Clint is. Great teammate, great defender, great communicator, great connected guy, all that great, all that sort of stuff. But for where the Hawks want to go, they needed they need more than what he gave him on offense this year. And he's mm-hmm. not the same defender he was three years ago. And that is very important context for where they are in roster decisions right now. That's a great way to put it. And look, he, he's – this sounds more derogatory than I made it, but he's a stopgap right now. That's kind of what he That's kind of what he is. I mean, look, we've discussed it, but there's this organizational, like, lack of clarity about what they want to be. We, we kind of know what, what Quinn likes, but, like, this, they've been in this, like – brain lock the last like year and a half where we, we just don't know what they're going to do next. And it's basically been nothing. They just kind of just stood still and that's going to end the summer. I, I have some pretty decent confidence in that. They're going to do something somewhere, <laughs> whether it be the number one pick is going to be made, I would imagine, but if it doesn't trades, etc. cetera. Um, and look, there's some value in having Clint around as a guy who you don't have to worry about. You know what Clint's going to do. But there's also the other side of that is that he you 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 know what he can't do, and you know what he isn't going to do. So uh, I think people will be fascinated to hear that you would that you would like to keep Clint if they draft Klingon. I agree with you, but I don't know how well that's going to go over. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where I don't care. Um, I don't care. I know, I, I know I, you don't. I, I, I get my analysis in. No, I know, and that's the thing. And I, I probably care too much, but no, I, I think we did a look. People are going to think what they think, but. Uh, my last thought is that Clint Capella is still a very, very competent starting level center. Uh, maybe he won't be. By the way, just one more, just to say this out loud, he may not be next year. There's a world okay. in which Clint just keeps physically declining and he's not that. So I'm, just, yep. I, I'm not sure I said that before. Just I'll say that at the very end, that is one of the dangers of a guy who's 30 and who has a lot of miles is that he might just be too far the other direction. Like he won't be out of the league or anything, but maybe he's next year. We'll, we'll, we'll look up in January and we're like, you know what? Clint's a backup now. That that might be a thing that happens. I, I, that's very much in play. Uh, Look at what DeAndre Jordan's been doing the last three years. That, DeAndre yeah, Jordan, Jordan so, was a top three defensive center in the league yep. in five, six, seven years, right? So it, it can ha- it can happen fast, and that's that's something we should at least acknowledge. And while Clint is really good at like the tricks of the trade stuff, the trade craft that I've talked about, like Sar needs in the future, like to play center, like Clint's really great at that stuff. But he had to learn it. Like he was super raw in Houston and all that stuff. And I, I just think that there is that's one factor. We did talk about the age, but there's downside risk if you go into next season trying to win and relying on Clint because he is that age where it could just come off the rails or he gets hurt or whatever. So uh super nuanced discussion. Hopefully people won't hate it too much. Although Glenn doesn't care if you hate <laughs> it. He just told you that. He doesn't care. I don't. I don't. I'm kidding. I, I'm, I'm not kidding, but he does. Uh, anyway, Glenn, thank you for being here. As always, we managed to get to an hour, as we always do. Uh, we could probably do another hour on Clint if we wanted to. We're not going to do that. Uh, anything to plug here in early June? This is going to come out sometime this week, so fire away. What's going on in your life? Yeah, I, so, you know, on Twitter, I will send a score Glenn. I'll be, you know, promoting some of the mocks I'm helping with, you know, in different outlets and things like that. Um, I know you spent some time on uh, Bryce's podcast, I uh, believe, and Hawks, uh, I did one yep. with him yesterday, so go check that out. Brian, as I said before, like our our growing community in the space around the Hawks is so good, you know. And so just just yeah, even if they might be podcasts that aren't quite so profile, I'll say yet, you know, go support them, go find yeah. them, support them. And Bry- Bryce does awesome work over there and stuff like that. That's then, that's that's Bryce. It, that's Bryce Lewis, by the way. Just to say his last name on the yeah. show. Oh, Bryce Lewis. Thank you, Brycey yes. underscore two K. Yep, is the, I was, is the handle there. So, uh, and then I, uh, you know. The guys at Peace Tree Hoops are doing a great job covering the dream. I love I love what they're doing covering the dream there. Wes and team are such an awesome team over there. So I just, just want to like I want to I want to ask for you to support all those people 
more than me. It's more important to me that those people get your support and 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 promote them and things like that because they they, they work really really hard. They work hard. They all work harder than me. At that, I just show up and talk, you know. <laughs> um, and so they just they they, they they just deserve a lot of support. Just want to see everybody in the community get support. So uh, you know, go find them and tell them you appreciate them and, and let them know that you pay attention to, to their work and appreciate their work. That's that's true. All those folks. While we're plugging Peachtree Hoops, I saw a vintage Graham Chapel uh, 5,000 word Melvin Agensa profile the other day, and my heart was just the size of uh, it was incredible. I, I loved it. So, uh, no, I'm I want to echo that. I, of course, used to run Peachtree Hoops, but um, I always wanted to do dream coverage and just don't have the time, which is not a negative. I, I, I really have enjoyed watching more WNBA. I just never have the band. I don't, yep. don't want to cover a team poorly. That's my did greatest you know fear. Is, did you know there's some stuff going on with Kate, Caitlin Clark? Did you know that? Bro? I, I did follow <laughs> that story. No, I I, I, I never uh, – the way I – and I, this might sound great. I never wanted to start covering the dream and do it poorly, and I, I thought I might just because of lack of time. So I never wanted to do that. But I, I'm you're right. Good coverage of, uh, of the Dream Over Peace Troops. And uh, follow ATL29, which is the podcast that Glenn and – Arch nemesis Kevin Chenard do great show there. I'm sure you'll have Entitled something going on before the draft. Tower Jones is now a regular on that show. In addition to his contributions yes. on this podcast on a regular basis. But anyway, thanks for being here, Glenn. I do appreciate it. And uh, we'll do capsules again. I don't know when the next one's going to be, because I'm cognizant that people are not quite in the player capsule space. Now it's going to be mostly draft from here on. And then we'll get into free agency, yeah. all that stuff, but we'll, we'll do another one or two at some point in the near future. Yeah. There's, there's one or two that, we might want to do before draft night just because they might get treated. So, well, that is, that is one of the reasons why I went to Clint today, just to be transparent. We wanted to make sure this got done because Clint might get traded. Uh, maybe we'll do DeAndre Hunter next. Maybe we'll do other guys, but uh, uh, we're, we're going to, we'll see what happens. But anyway, thank you for being great. Thank you for being here as always, Glenn. As everybody else, please subscribe to this show anywhere you might find podcasts, YouTube on the video side, Apple, Spotify, five star ratings and reviews. Uh, follow the show on Twitter as well at Loft on Hawks if you uh, are still on that platform. Thank you for being everybody, and I appreciate it. And we'll see you all next time.